Uh, so, uh, hello everybody, welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Smith, although I'm generally known as GG2K online for reasons that aren't as funny as you might imagine, which is why I don't explain it to anybody. Uh, I am a developer advocate at a database company you may have heard of called MongoDB, and I've been asked to make something very clear. My employer does not use or endorse any of the techniques I'm about to teach you in this uh, presentation. Furthermore, I do not uh, use or endorse any of the techniques demonstrated in this presentation. Any harm you cause to your person or your career using techniques that I'm about to show you are entirely at your own discretion. On every computer I have had for the last 20 years, I have created a folder called Stupid Python Tricks. Uh, I use it to try out features of Python in ways that wouldn't get past a code review because they're too silly or weird. Um, I've, uh, at some point I, in the past, I've lost some of this code, so these days I keep it in a GitHub repository. Don't worry, I will be giving you a link to that later on in this talk. Uh, these days, yeah, so I, every so often I like to take some of this code out, brush it off, and show it to people um, to see how they respond. And if you uh, feel the need to respond, feel free to ask me questions at the end um, or uh, tweet at me at gg2k. So, this talk is in two halves. Um, I, I'm going to show you two stupid tricks. Each one uses a handful of techniques. Um, in each half, I'll try to describe the th stupid thing that I am trying to do, and then the thought processes that I went through to try and make that, that stupid thing actually work. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce you to a library I wrote about five years ago called Ish. I wrote it for a lightning talk, uh, just for like code comedy. Um, but it was quite popular, and uh, now it's had multiple contributors, and I think it may be my most popular repository on GitHub, which is worrying. <laughs> so, let's talk about types in Python. I like types, and Python's very forgiving with them generally. Um, for example, here's how you compare two Boolean values. And as you might expect, because true on the left-hand side, true on the right-hand side, they're the same thing, so they're equal to each other. Um, in fact, just excuse me a moment, I may start to get notifications, and that would be bad. Uh, there we go. So, uh, yep, as, as you might expect, false is the opposite of true, and therefore it doesn't evaluate to the same as true. Um, so that, that is kind of what you'd expect. Um, for historical reasons, one is also equal to true, and zero is equal to false, or zero is not equal to true. This is where it starts to get interesting. If I compare a string containing the word true to the value true, um, that evaluates as uh, true, which is great. Um, this is exactly what we want. The um, only problem is that the string containing the word false also evaluates to true. And this is because only empty strings uh, evaluate to the same as true. Uh, and an empty string that you put the word false into is no longer empty, and therefore it is, uh, it is considered to be true. Um, so that's not really what we want. Um, oh, I want something that's not exactly true, um, but it's true-ish. And this is what I'm going to show you how to build. Um, so the idea is we can add ish to the end of a Boolean variable, and we get something that now uh, evaluates to, it understands that it's the same as the word true, um, or it understands that if, you, if you're looking at a string that's kind of got a falsy value, um, that that is, in fact, not true-ish. Um, now, you may be sitting there wondering, why? Why would I want to do such a thing? And I would say that you're probably in the wrong talk. There's a, a friend of mine, Chuck, is giving a talk in like one of the rooms next door about uh, the supply chain security. I, you should probably go and see that instead. But assuming that you're going to stay here, um, but let's, talk back, let's go back to what I want. So this is, this is what I just showed you. Um, but let's just take a step backwards. Um, Let's, let's ignore the hyphen between the true and the ish at the moment, because that's just adding some complexity. Let's just try to create a value called true-ish that we can compare to these strings and, uh, and get the kind of values that we want. So how do I change the way the equals operator works? Um, well, let me talk about what Python does when you use the, uh, the equality operator. So first, behind the scenes, Python will take the left-hand value and it will call this magic EQ method. Now, I tend to, some people call these dunder methods because they have a double underscore at the start and the end. Whenever you see one of these things, it is changing the way that Python works. It's like an internal uh, mechanism to Python. That you should consider them to be reserved names. You should only use them when you know what they do. And I'll show you how you can find out what they do um, short, 
slightly further on in this talk. Um, so because the string true has, has never seen a truish before, um, it, it doesn't know what to do. So the uh, correct thing for it to do in this case is just a razor not implemented. Um, so that is what it does, because it just doesn't know what on earth we're talking about. Um, fortunately, Python then has another go. So it takes the right-hand value, and it calls the same method on it, and passes in the left-hand value uh, as a parameter. And in this case, um, it, I've implemented a truish, which I'm going to show you how to do, and that we want that to return true, because we consider a truish to be equal to the word true. Um, so it's just the same method called the other way around. So uh, you may be asking yourself, how do I know this um, if you're relatively new to Python? And I, I, the reason I know this is because it's all documented in a document in the official Python documentation called the Python data model. If you haven't read this before, I really recommend going and having a read. Um, it describes so much cool stuff that you can do with classes uh, and different special methods and values uh, in Python, and so many of the stupid tricks uh, that I've learned in the past have come from this document. So um, here's the class that I came up with. Uh, there are definitely ways to write this class, and the real version is a little bit longer, but it, at its heart, it's, it's just really a, an if-else statement. So inside this eq method that I'm implementing, I'm checking the value that's passed in, which would be the string true or the string false in this case, and I'm just comparing it to a set of values um, that I've kind of predefined. Um, so we consider, you know, all those values we consider to be truish, and in that case we return true because now that those things are equal. Um, and then we check those, the value against all these false values that I've defined, um, and in that case we want it to return false because the, the string that's been passed in is, is, is false-ish. Um, and if we get a value that doesn't make any sense, um, we just raise a, an error called maybe, which I, I thought that was funny. Um, so <laughs> there's a maybe error, so let's try it out. So I, can, I take my truish. Most of these um, special class methods only work on instances. So the first thing we have to do is create an instance of our truish class, um, and then we compare it against a Boolean true, and we get true, that's good. And we compare it against a string containing the word true, and that's also considered true, so that's good. Uh, and then we uh, compare it to false, and it's false. We compare it to the string false, and it's false. And then we compare it to the string lemons, uh, and we get a maybe error, which is exactly what we want. So this is, this is pretty cool. This is, this is kind of what we were talking about. Um, but that, this is actually what I wanted. So this, this is like just being able to hyphenate a variable um, and add this. Add this, uh, th this is a convention in English where you add ish to an end of something, and it suddenly becomes vague, which is kind of handy. Um, so. You can see that this looks like a hyphen, but it's not. It's a minus. It's a subtraction operator in Python. And so we should talk about how subtraction works in Python. Um, so here, it, when you subtract something from something else, Python does something very similar to what it does when you're comparing things for equality. Uh, but in this case, it calls this magic sub method. And it, it calls it on the left-hand side and passes it, uh, passes it the right-hand value uh, as a parameter. So in this case, a Boolean has never seen an ish before, so it doesn't know what to do, so it does the similar thing to EQ. The problem is with subtraction, with equality, you can swap the left and right operators and, and try again, right? But in this case, if you um, change the order of the uh, operands to a subtraction, you're going to get a different value, so you're going to get the negative of, um, of the original operation. So we can't just call sub with the values reversed. Um, instead, we have to call this r sub. Um, method, which is just, it's, it's just basically saying, I'm calling subtraction on the right-hand operand in this case. Um, so we need to implement that. Here's the class that I came up with. Again, it's basically an if statement. It's saying, if I've just been passed true on the left-hand side, then return a true-ish, which we've already seen the definition of. And if I'm passed a false, return a false-ish. Now, I haven't shown you how to define false-ish, false but I'm pretty certain you can work it out for yourselves. That's definitely an exercise uh, for you to implement in your own time. So again, I've had to implement this as my ish variable, and now I can subtract it from a true and get a true-ish, and then I can compare the, the result of that to the string true and the string false, and um, I can also create a false-ish and compare that to false and get a true. So I apologize for saying true and false far too many times in this part of the conversation, but hopefully this all makes sense. Uh, all of this code is in a repository on GitHub uh, called ish, 
Um, if you enjoyed it, I hi I, if you enjoyed this part of the talk, I highly recommend that you check it out. Um, it does a few things that this library that you've just seen doesn't do. So um, it can deal with slang, for example, um, German uh, for yes. Uh, it will also do fuzzy matching on numbers, so you can compare 1.51. That's extremely useful for testing, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and a friend of mine, Jeffrey French, added a neural network to it that allows you to pass in <laughs> photographs of people pulling faces, and it will compare it to an emotion and tell you whether the face is happy or sad. Uh, I've actually removed the code from, that, from there because it, it makes the library more complicated as a teaching tool, but um, it's in there in the history if you really want to go and check it out. So the, thing, the main thing I've been getting at in this part of the talk is that there's these special uh, or Dunder methods and things that are ways of changing the way that Python behaves in sometimes subtle ways, if you like. Uh, there are, they're a way of opening up a hatch into the Python language and just kind of rummaging around and changing things. So what have we learned in this section? Well, we've learned about uh, overloading equality, uh, we've um, overloaded subtraction, um, and we've learned about the Python data model, which is really the reference document for, for all the crazy stuff you might want to do in Python. So now we get to the second part of the talk, um, which I have called Fun with Math. And uh, so if you want a reasonably accurate version of Pi, you can access that through the math module. Um, and here's what it looks like when you do that. So you import math, you print out the value of math.pi, and you get this number. But um, I'm, uh, unfortunately, I'm sure we all know that that is not an exact version of Pi, because we all know the correct value of Pi is 3. Fortunately, you can fix the math module's behavior. So if you import math, um, you can then just assign a new value to math.py. That's an entirely valid thing to do. Uh, and then uh, in other parts of your code base, uh, if you import math and, uh, and print out pi, you'll get this new value that we've installed somewhere else in the vast code base that we're working on. Uh, and then for some reason, when I've done this in, uh, on projects that I've worked on in the past, the uh, develop my fellow developers have got slightly upset with me. I never really understood why. Um, so it's really it's better if you can sneak in the improved value of pi over time. So this is what I want to achieve. I want to import math, and each time I print out pi, I want that value to just get a little bit closer to the real value of 3. <laughs> so, so the idea is, is that the value is different every time you access math.py. <laughs> And hopefully, hopefully uh, the developers I'm working with haven't memorized those last few digits, so it's going to be a little bit harder to detect until later on in the running of this program. So, so why, why on earth would I want to do this? And I would say, well, we're already halfway through the talk, so there's no point in leaving now, really. You might as well see what, where we go uh, in the second half. So, um, well, the code, so the code could look like this. So um, in my module, my special math module, I can import the original outdated math module and just assign it to a variable called underscore math to just sort of keep it safe. Um, I can take the original version of pi, which we want to improve, and just store that away. And then each time we call pi function, um, I can access that global variable, modify it by a tiny amount. Now, this is not moving towards 3, because I'm simplifying the code, so it's actually increasing by a tiny amount. Um, and then we return the new value. So this is a way of changing the value of pi each time. So what does it look like to actually use this code? Well, we import my special math module that I just implemented, and then we call pi a few times, and each time we get the values that we wanted. But but what are these? Like those, that isn't the way that math works. Like pi is an attribute, not a not a method. So we need to get rid of those somehow. Um, and fortunately, Python has a way of calling executable code without making it look like you're calling execu executable code. And that is the property decorator. Um, so we've probably all used this. The only problem is that this is not going to work. So you can't use the property decorator on a top-level function. It only works with classes and methods. So I guess we have to work with this restriction. So I'm just going to take that, and I'm going to put that in a class called new math. Um, now we don't have a global anymore, so that's quite nice. We can just get um, underscore pi out of self. Um, but essentially, this, is, this works the same way. So what does this look like in the client code when you're using it? So 
Uh, excuse me, I clicked too many times. Um, so this time we get our math um, module at the top by instantiating a new math instance, and then the rest of it actually looks like we want. So now I'm accessing pi, and each time I'm getting a slightly different value. So this is closer, um, but it's still not quite right because of that bit that I've highlighted in green up there. So we don't want to instantiate this class. We want to get this when we import math. So let me introduce you to sys.modules. Now, some of you may have encountered this before. Um, the modules dict um, is a, a dictionary of module name to the actual mod uh, module code that has been imported. So each time you import a module, um, it put, once it's loaded that file, it then sticks the code in this dictionary so that the rest of the Python program can access it without having to actually reload that code from disk. Um, so to demonstrate what I mean, if I look up math, in the sysmodules dict, I, I get an error because I haven't actually imported math at this point. So if I then go and import math, now when I access that, I get back the module that has been loaded from disk. Um, and it's the same. It's exactly the same thing as you get when you import math, like, like I've done two lines previously. So almost everything in Python is mutable. This is why I like writing stupid Python co py code in Python. Um, and because it's mutable, you change it. Um, so let's manually modify sysmodules and pretend that the code that we've, um, we've imported is actually this object that we've just instantiated. So now I'm sticking in my, my class instead of a module. Um, and now if I import math, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to do anything because it's already got um, something called math in sysmodules. It's just going to return the new math object that I put in there. Um, Python doesn't care. This is how duct typing works. Uh, and I know we all love duct typing. Uh, so here is the, uh, the new math class that I've implemented um, you, th that you've seen before. And then you don't even have to write this somewhere in your code base. This can be within the new math module itself. It just swaps out math. It just inserts math at the end of loading this library. So now when we use this library, oops, excuse me, I import math helper, which is the code that you've just seen, and then I import math, it does nothing, and now whenever I access math.py, I get these slightly different values. Um, so we're now, we're, this, is, this is pretty good. Um, so now we're done, right? Uh, but there is actually, there is actually just a little bit more. I have a problem. So it turns out math doesn't just contain an attribute called pi. It also contains a function called seal that, that calculates the ceiling of a floating point number. And if seal is missing, then my colleagues may become aware of the thing that I've done in our production application. Um, so. So I can go, go, go back to my math module, and I can implement seal. Like, it's not that hard, right? I just need to produce this stub that just passes through the call to the seal function in the actual math module that I stored away earlier in my code. Um, so now we're done, right? But I mean, actually, we're not. So it, I don't know about you. So I, I looked up the docs of the math module, um, and it turns out it's really big. Uh, did you know that mathematicians had learned so much stuff? It just goes on and on and on. <laughs> so it was a surprise to me. Um, so at this point, I realized I was going to have to implement a stub for everything in there, and this project suddenly became a lot more boring than it had been up until this point. Um, so I started thinking about maybe loading the math module and then looping through all the contents using the DIR method. Um, and, but then I, I, I decided to just sort of take a step back and think about what's really happening here when you use attributes from the math module. So let's look at this call for to math seal. And it may not be immediately obvious, but you're actually doing two things here. So the first thing you're doing is you're looking up an attribute called seal, and then you're calling it because it's a method. The thing that is returned when you do that lookup is, is a method in this case. Um, so how do we change the way that attribute lookup works? Oh, if you go through the documentation, there is a thing called get getatter. Um, and this is a fallback. So when you access an attribute on uh, a class, if that attribute isn't defined, but the class does define this fallback method, then it will call it with the name of the thing you've just asked for. 
Um, so I can implement this. In, oh, so actually I've got, got a short illustration. So if I try to access an attribute called lemons, which has not been defined on this object, um, then it will call this method with the name lemon. So that's the name of the attribute that I'm looking up in the first line. So we can implement this, and I can implement, the, uh, this is where some naming gets awkward, so the dunder get at a method that I'm implementing takes the name of the things that, that I want, and then I can use this helpful um, built-in function called get at a, but without the underscores, and all that does is it takes a thing, uh, an object of some kind that you want to look up an attribute on, so in this case the math module, um, and then you, it, you pass it the name of the thing that you want, and it will do what's necessary behind the scenes to give you that thing to do a dynamic lookup for the thing that you're asking for. Um, so now we're proxying through. Um, oops, and that, so this is actually complete now. So now this module, in many ways, um, it should behave pretty much the same way as the original math module, but with the improved value of pi coming through, because that's actually defined, so we don't need to call, call the fallback method. Um, now, I implemented this a few years ago, and all these um, hoops were kind of necessary in terms of swapping in a, uh, an object for a module um, and calling, calling this get at a thing and to pass things through. Um, you can actually do this more simply now in Python 3.7. So get at a only used to work on classes. Now it works on modules. And so, in fact, we can implement this whole thing in a single function in our um, math helper class. So we just implement get at a, and if we're looking for pi, then we do the little bit of executable code that we wanted to execute. And if it isn't pi that we're looking for, then we just pass that through using get at a again. So this is much, much more simple. Um, so, uh, what have we learned in this half of the talk? Well, firstly, modules and objects are basically interchangeable, and you can do that as you like. Uh, you have to modif manually modify the sysmodules dict, but that is basically it. Um, modules can't use the property decorator, but objects can, and you can take advantage of that. Uh, if you put an object where people expect a module to be, uh, you can get behavior that's... Um, unexpected. Almost everything in Python is mutable, um, except some things that are implemented in C, and those can be trickier to mess around with, but there are ways that you can do that, and it's just an extra challenge um, wh when you're trying to achieve these things. Uh, and finally, you discovered how to uh, magically create any attribute you like on request, and this would allow you, for example, to, um, to implement a cl a classes that can um, spell check your method requests and automatically call the correct method when you misspell um, the method name in, a call in calling code. There's actually a library out there that does that, but I forget the name of it. So uh, this code, uh, or something like it, uh, is also on GitHub, along with a whole bunch of other more complex examples using things like meta classes and directly implementing the descriptor protocol. Uh, but most of it takes advantage of things I've covered here today, modifying things you're not supposed to modify, and using dunder values in ways that they weren't intended for. So you don't have to be a Python expert to write weird and wonderful code. You just have to have some time and the urge to be creative. So if you haven't written stupid Python code before um, on purpose, then this is just the start of your journey. Um, there are the special dunder methods and variables that I've mentioned before in this talk. Um, read the Python data model to find a list of most of them along with how they're supposed to work. Um, and if you don't know what the descriptor protocol is, like definitely go and check that out as well, because it's basically the way that, um, that things are looked up on classes. Um, it explains the way that things, that things like methods work, where the self parameter comes from when you actually call uh, a method. Um, and it also, it's also how property, class method, and static method decorators are implemented. So I mean, it's really worth, um, worth learning how those work. So eval is a lot of fun. You can build up Python code in strings and then just execute it as executable code. Um, and I really wanted to cover meta classes, but there's just no way to fit that into a 30-minute talk. And I don't normally promote other talks that I've given, but I did give a 70-minute talk on classes and meta classes at PyCon Australia a few years ago, and I think it provides a pretty good introduction to the topic, um, and also some more fun stuff around inheritance, if you like that kind of thing. Um, the disk package is like really advanced magic if you, if you want to do some, some strange stuff in Python. Um, it allows you to disassemble blocks of Python code, 
mess around with what is essentially the assembly and put it back together again as executable code. Uh, my friend Sebastian uh, has put together a library that allows you to use GoTo inside Python uh, functions using this technique. It's, uh, it's very cool. So uh, finally, the way, that Py the, the way that Python finds and loads code can be changed as well using import hooks um, in this import li library. Um, and that would allow you to, for example, import modules that weren't even written in Python into your Python uh, code. Uh, so there are so many opportunities to write terrible Python code on purpose. And again, you may be asking yourself, like, why? Why have you wasted all this time doing this? Um, and like to seriously answer this question, for me, it's an opportunity to try out features of the language that I don't necessarily have a use case for yet. So hopefully, if I get to a point where, where one of these things is the right solution to a problem, then I sort of recognize that pattern. Um, and it's a puzzle. So you can work at it two ways. You can kind of pick your destination, like I have in these two examples, and try and work out the tricks that you need to learn to get that code to work. Or you can learn a new feature of the language in some depth and then see what inspiration hits you for kind of the, the, the crazy stuff you might be able to do with it. So I've actually got friends who I swap crazy code like this with. Um, so it, it, I've, I've met them at conferences like this after I've demonstrated slightly weird code. And so it can be quite a good thing from a social perspective in terms of meeting um, slightly weird people. Uh, but mainly, mainly I do it so that when I um, get to show someone the code or post it on Twitter uh, or show it to Hinnick, uh, I, I get to hear somebody go, but why? So, thank you very much for coming, and I'm sorry for wasting your time. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Judy. That was terrible in the best possible way. <laughs> so, as you would expect with a talk like this, uh, almost all questions are actually trolling. <laughs> um, yeah, one question is that I'm just gonna quote this. Have you asked Lukas to make black format-ish correctly? I'm just gonna say, if you ever do that, I want to see his face while you do that, so. <laughs> Same. Same. Uh, then we have some semi-serious uh, questions. Why are you using the getter function on the original math class instead of dunder get, uh, getter on the module? And I think it's, oh, I, it's just cleaner, right? Well, like, I answered that already. So yeah. I, what I, I wanted to show a handful of techniques, and so the old way of doing it just included more stuff. I know. Uh, he means like when you're, uh, you're using the get other function, mm -hmm. but you could have also written underscore math. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I but I that. think for all intents and purposes, it's the same thing. The one is more idiomatic. I, I uh, could I have used meta classes to get autocomplete on new math? I think the answer yes. is always yes, yes. right? Yes. <laughs> always yes. <laughs> if there's meta classes and can I, then it's always yes. Should I is a different answer. Yeah, so someone uh, finds JavaScript less weird now. Um, someone, someone got fired-ish because of you. <laughs> and someone else is, is asking you to break NumPy, scikit-learn, and uh, TensorFlow. So there's your mission for the next. Cool. Yeah, Next I'll month. give a talk on that. And we are ending just on time. Thank you, everyone. Please don't use it in production. <laughs> <laughs>